Hi, Graham Vincent, violin maker, musician. Um, a lot of you know where I live in Somerset and you probably realise that only just down the road is Yandel and Son, um, which is a fairly well-known timber merchant. And uh, I couldn't resist coming down here this weekend because they've got 20% off all timber. So I'm just having a quick look around and uh, I have a horrible feeling that I might well be tempted. So let's have a good look, see what they've got. Well, there's a piece of bird's eye maple for scale. What is it? Is that more than the span wide? Uh, 69 pounds, so take 20% off that. So that's, what's that? 56 pounds and there's enough there for maybe, uh, one, two, three, four, probably five violins. So that works out at 11 quid a violin for the backs and sides. That's not bad. I've never made one in Elm, but wow, that's tempting. I'm always on the lookout for ash with a good figure to it. Not that piece, I don't think. It always surprises me how cheap some types of wood are and how expensive others are. I'm always looking for well-figured English sycamore as well. I think these are nice boards, but uh, not really interesting enough for, for my purposes. Lovely bit of brown oak and also pippy oak as well. Got some nice grain in it, nice medullary rays. Lots of stuff for turners, some exotic stuff as well. Do, do, do. It's very handy having this down the road for me. As well as. <laughs> I could spend a lot of money in here. Anyway, let's find somewhere a bit quieter and uh, let's have a look at some of the Q&A questions for this week, shall we? I was going to do the Q&A wandering around the, uh, the wood yard and so on, but every time I got it set up, uh, it, I realised I was interrupting people sort of rooting through wood piles and so on. And uh, the last thing I want to hear is me wittering on, probably. So I'm sitting here in my, in my daughter's car, funnily enough. Uh, I dropped off the, um, my one at the garage yesterday. Uh, and actually, miracles and miracles, the... Uh, my geriatric Ford Galaxy has actually passed its MOT test uh, without needing any work done. So that's uh, uh, unusually, uh, unusually good news because normally that car brings me um, expense, but uh, not this time. Yay. Anyway, that's not really relevant to uh, violin making. Sorry. Uh, so I printed out uh, most of the questions um, from this last week. So let's dive straight in. Um, uh, so Phil X C S or oh, Phil X C skier. That must be cross country skier, I guess. Uh, I don't know if this is helpful or not, but Windsor and Newton do have a line of water soluble oil paints. Might be worth trying out in the shellac alcohol mix. I've also looked at how shellac is produced, and I believe the colour is based on how long the flakes are cooked. While you can buy slightly more amber flakes, I'm curious to try and bake some in the oven and see if it's possible to cook them up to different darker colours. As always, thanks for making the videos and sharing. That's really interesting, isn't it? Um, both of those things. Yeah, I mean, um, I think in all honesty, I'm highly likely to try out both of those. So yeah, I'll keep you posted about how, how that one goes. That's really interesting. I mean, obviously, you know, um, I've mentioned that one of the ways of getting pigment for varnish and so on, one of the easiest ways is to buy, you know, oil paints. Um, so this, this is quite interesting. I, I don't know how an oil, I suppose it must be emulsified in some way that allows it to, to, to blend with water. But we'll, I'll look into that. It's really, that is interesting. Carrican 430. Hi there. I was wondering about those, uh, those, open pore woods like mahogany and ash etc uh, before varnish do you fill the pores or 
just shellac sealed then start to varnish thanks um okay so yeah this is obviously a question about filling grain uh and my answer to that basically is with some of the violins i've done like the ash ones in particular i've actually wanted to keep the open grain the open poor structure as part of the part of the appeal uh, it's part of the character of the wood and uh, so i made the decision to sort of go with that um on a couple of them i have filled it um and i did that by basically flooding it with varnish cutting it back cutting it back more varnish cutting it back now, obviously after the ground and so on um but i mean there, there are different ways of doing it one of the most common ones is to use um pumice in whether it's an oil or whether it's a varnish whatever um to actually sort of fill the pores the theory being that pumice has pretty much exactly the same refractive index as most varnishes or similar to most varnishes sufficiently similar so that it effectively just becomes as far as you're you know looking at it goes it becomes part of the varnish to the eye um then there was also um i don't know how you pronounce it what's it called it's pozzuoli pozzuoli it's an italian uh, italian word or roman word pozzuoli i guess um which is a mixture of pumice and lime and quite a few people have postulated that that was used uh, as a filler on violin making i'm not sure what the evidence for that is i don't know um but it's it's i mean pumice is fairly easily obtainable worst case scenario you can go to a sort of a, a bathroom shop and buy a pumice stone um for scrubbing your, your feet and actually crush crush that down but you know it's it's um available in in various grades um quite widely um i mean it, it certainly pumice is something that's found a lot in um in the surface of timber and th there's debate and i've said this before whether it's actually whether it was actually just there because it was being used as an abrasive or whether it was being used most definitely as part of the um of the sort of pore filling grain filling kind of exercise i'm gonna turn on the ignition and open a window because I'm already starting to actually cook sitting here in the car park. The um, the sun has been in and out uh, this morning and it's out at the moment and gosh it's warm. And I've got a jumper on as well. Might have to take that off in a minute. Um, Gervais Gallant, thanks for the video. And I'll contribute with a question about part two of your viola video where you realise the Spanish cedar ribs are a bit troublesome. Do you have any advice on rib bending? I've recently gone through a session of bending nice straight grain birch and some troublesome figured birch. I've been soaking the ribs for half uh, for, for an hour in warm water before starting the bending. The maple tends to break easily, especially on the sea boats. So change so I changed my process to not pre-soak and to give just a little spritz of water before starting. For the birch, the one hour bath seemed to make the rib too noodly and they went easily out of square. So I now just soak it for 10 minutes. That seemed to work. Any thoughts? Okay, uh, I think I have tried so many different methods of actually bending ribs. Um, at one end of the spectrum, I actually cut moulds uh, for each section, a male and a female sort of counterpart mould, and I just threw the rib into boiling water, took it out, plopped it in the mould, and cramped it shut. And amazingly fast and generally produced a good result. Um, on the tighter bits of the curve you have to be careful bending it um, so that it doesn't crumple or break uh, but that's the same with any type of bending process and I'll cover that in a second. So that was one method I used. Um, obviously I've used the the traditional one just a bending iron and maybe adding a little bit of water sometimes not depending what the timber is but in all of these things crucially um for the tighter curves you probably want to be using a bending strap um now that a bending strap in, i'm sure you all know this but a bending strap basically is a thin and very flexible piece of steel generally steel um which 
stops the tendency of the wood to actually sort of start to bend in one area only and then snap um, because it, it won't allow it, you know it, this sort of springy piece of steel um, forces a uniform curve on the on the timber and so I mean that's why you see people with these bending straps like a piece of steel or something similar with handles on each end you know holding bits of wood against the bending iron with those it's so that you force a uniform curve and it prevents buckling um, on the latest video you've probably seen me doing um, this this is the part two of the viola one I I'm doing this sort of curious um, hybrid, if you like, method where I'm I've got a, a water bath. I'm throwing the sort of um, throwing the ribs into this into this boiling water, taking them out, bending them on a bending iron using a bending strap. But they are so pliable at that stage. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, I've I've not noticed any difference in how the timber looks or how it behaves based on any of these approaches. I think you do probably, uh, your, your comment, Joyce, about the noodliness, if you like, of the birch, um, and I know very much what you mean about it sort of getting out of square and so on. I think using the bending strap on the bending iron is going to get over that as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, um, I, I guess at the end of the day, whatever works for you is valid, I think. Although I'm sure there are a lot of the more traditional makers will be screaming in anguish at these, uh, what I've just said. Monty Latham, 739. Graham, I like the guitar shaped violin. Would you be selling the plans at some point? Um, yes, I am. They are available on my shop on Graham Vincent Violins basically you can actually uh, buy those plans now. I wasn't going to kind of publicize those until I'd finished making myself the guitar shaped violin so that I could double double check that I had all the necessary information on there but there it is they are up there and they are the, it's the same set of plans that I produce for myself that I'm working from whilst I'm actually making this violin. Um, also, have you ever used glass scrapers? Yeah, that's, Monty, that's something we've talked about before. I have. Um, a lot of people really like them. I don't, because you kind of, you end up with little bits of glass all over the place. Um, and that's enough to spoil the day on occasions. It has once or twice in the past for me. You end up cutting yourself. So. I tend not to. Um, I like the consistency and the reliability of a steel scraper. Uh, you know what you're going to get. Once you get into the habit of how to sharpen them, they're very easy to use. So for me, they, they still win, I'm afraid, but having tried glass. Um, Chris Tynan Portraits. Hi, Graham. Having got the violin bug. Oh, dear. What can I say? I've been watching a maker from Sweden, Peter Westerlund's Violin Werkstatt AB. Uh, yeah, after shaping the top and back, he then rubs his finger over areas. Then when he gets a bright sound, he then removes that small area of wood until the scratch tone matches, doing inside and outside of each plate. The plates having up a, uh, end up having a very similar tone all over, and this method would give the same sound on each violin made. Do you, do you do anything like this? They do sound nice. They do. I've I've watched that video previously. I think he he actually suggests that that's one of the reasons why Guarneri has that deep, um, like a pin, like a little drill, uh, like a braddle hole in the centre of the back, almost all the way through the back. Uh, and this is something that you find in uh, a lot of Guarneri violins, apparently. Not that I had a look in many Guarneri violins um, and he suggests that he held the back like that whilst he was doing doing that like that. Personally I think that's slightly unlikely. I suspect he just used a drill bit to actually sort of drill through once he'd shaped the outside to drill down as close as he dare to the full thickness so that it gave him something to work to and on occasion he actually went a little bit too far and that's when 
it breaks the surface on on the back so that's my thinking for that little that little hole but what do i know um as far as peter westland's violins go i'm quite clearly he makes wonderful violins and um this is his method of doing it um and i love the fact that he's been happy to tell everyone as well it's wonderful um it's not something i do i like i said before i tend to work on the basis of it should feel right so i kind of generally i know this sounds really really woolly but i just tend to work by flexing the top tapping the top seeing how i feel and when when i'm kind of happy with it then i know it's right and also in terms of thickness i think i've said this before i tend to work on the basis of start at three mil and keeping in mind that flexing and how you feel keep taking it down until you start to worry about it when you start to worry about it that's that's my that's my guide point for it's about thin enough um right um i'm gonna stop there and take my jumper off because i'm cooking absolutely cooking jumper off glasses on okay uh, v oe 9 zr what do you think of the idea of dismantling an old 70s Skylark, for example, and reusing the aged wood from this, reshaping, thicknessing, a new base bar, fingerboard and all parts, stripping back varnish to white wood, of course, treating varnish with oil or shellac base, etc. I've done one, and with some dominant strings on it, it sounds rich and sonorous. I'd compare it to at least a $1,000, I guess, pound, dollar violin, and I play it at church each week. Sounds lovely, I'm told. I use an old boozy, professional style fiddle and it sounds better than that and others I've played. I'm attempting to make a few from scratch with new timber, but slow progress. I hope to compare them with it later. Uh, I'd like to get the chance to compare it with a better violin priced above the £10,000 mark. I think it would compare well if I put some Eva Parazzi strings on it. What's your opinion on this? Have you ever used wood for an old cheaper model violin or any old violin for that matter? As long as the wood is sound and not deteriorated, then it seems quite practical to me if you can get decent results. Yeah, well, uh, you may or may not have seen uh, as a, a little part of one of the sort of um, videos I've been doing, I am in the process of actually sort of um, using the body from a, an old Czechoslovakian violin um, which I'm doing pretty much exactly what you what you've described. I've I took it apart. Um, I regraduated the front. I put a new bass bar onto it, and I put the body back together. And in the next couple of weeks, I'll make a neck for it and and hopefully get it up and running. Um, so, also um, someone called Helen gave me uh, an old um, viola which she hasn't been using, which again is is 1970s Skylark. And um, I bought some strings for it, and it sounds surprisingly good. But you can still tell that it's not—it's not free um, as it could be. Um, it's not as open sounding as it could be. So m my plan is pretty much exactly the same as you described here. With that, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to probably get rid of the neck because the the scroll carving is is it's not very exciting, to say the least. Um, the fingerboard certainly needs replacing. Yeah, the neck's quite clunky as well, but the body itself is fine. So it is kind of, uh, I think it'll be a sort of a shortcut to getting a decent instrument, reasonably decent. I would say with these Skylark ones um, and similar, when I've stripped some of those in the past, you do end up with a violin that's got a striking orange kind of stain to the actual timber. So just bear that in mind um but no um i suppose it depends what you want really it is faster and easier than starting from scratch and you end up with a decent violin but you don't end up with a violin you've made so if you want your own violin that you've made do the whole thing um if you just want the fastest route to a good violin that might be one way of getting there because yeah it certainly will be a reasonable violin if you if you take care over it I hope that makes sense um so yeah it's not something I, I mean something I fully understand it's not something I'd want to do all the time it's not something I'd want to do professionally but it is like I say it's it's certainly valid um Alex Uricat Alex Uricat 
I do apologise. I, I know I slaughter some of these names. I really do. Um, hi, Graham. I always enjoy your post. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Just a small question. I would just ask if you use a special clamp tool when you glue the neck. Um, yeah, I do. I'm not in the workshop at the moment, obviously. Um, I basically, a few years ago, I threw out an aerial mount and it had two big U-shaped bolts. Um, I've now used those with a, with a bit of wood across there and a floating piece of wood and wing nuts. No, but future me is in the workshop and these are the ones I'm talking about. Very simple, uh, but these, these are the ones I tend to use for that job. They just work really well. So they actually go on each side of the thing and I use that to sort of from the button at the back through to the front of the neck. Um, I generally try and get my joints as good as I possibly can so that as little effort is required in the clamping. I think if you have to actually really use a lot of force on anything, then you haven't bent the thing well enough, you haven't shaped the thing well enough, you haven't cut the joint well enough. So I tend to try and get joints to fit really nicely. So most joints could probably work with finger pressure whilst the gel of the gel of, of the hide glue sets and after that could be left to their own devices. Having said that, necks, I really like there to be a good connection between the button and the back of the neck because that is such an important part of the structure of the violin, actually sort of holding the leverage, you know, the, with those strings on it, you know, the, the, the neck wants to go forward and one of the things that's stopping it, one of the things doing a lot of work is that connection with the back through the button. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, G-A-W-A-J-N. I've no idea how to pronounce your, your, your title, sorry. Ever tried torrified wood for a violin top? It seems quite popular in the guitar building work. I ask because there is a company near me that does this process for a very, very well-known guitar maker. I was thinking that I might try a few pieces. Uh, yeah, I have. I've done about five violins with it. Um, and they were five lovely violins. And I thought, wow, this is really significant. And then I did another five violins, pretty much the same without, and they were every bit as good. Um, so, I mean, it did actually kind of, it was quite useful in that it started imparting a nice color to the timber, which helped with the finishing process. But in terms of what it did to the sound and so on, I don't really think it, it made a huge difference. Um, so it's not something I've done now for a couple of years. Um, but there we go. It's, uh, again, I think, I mean, try it. I think everything's valid, I really do. Andrew Parrish. Uh, how thick do you do your ribs onto a violin? Uh, to, I think it's your ribs two on a violin. And how thick were the ribs on your new viola build? Okay, I use that that little tiny little thickness measure that you've seen me using, and I normally just make sure they're about one point three mil before I scrape, and then from that point on, it's whatever they end up with and that I'm happy with. So they're. They, they're, they're not going to be ever thicker than 1.3 and I'd be surprised if they're less than sort of 1.1. So 1.2, I'm guessing if you had to put a figure on it, I would say they'd probably end up at 1.2. But, you know, it varies. And as I've said many times, I actually think variation on an instrument in the thickness of the front plates, the back and the ribs is useful. I think it helps. Future me here. Yeah, and also the viola sides, uh, I started at about 1.4, so they probably ended up probably about 1.3, I would have thought. Um, shall I explain why? I think that because my theory is if any, if the instrument, if the box, the body is too good, 
at producing a particular frequency, then you may get wolf notes and you won't get a balanced sound. So for me, I think the best way to get a balanced sound is, and this sounds a bit odd, to not make it too good at reproducing, you know, producing any one particular frequency. And so I think breaking up the thicknesses is probably a good way to do that. And and that might go part of the way to explain why a lot of old violins which have, you know, lots of little studs, patches on the front and so on, still make the most wonderful sound. There we go. Um, Chris Tynan Portraits has been asking me now for a couple of weeks to actually sort of show you the little sound post setting tool setup that I have and I've been promising to do so. And here I am in the car and obviously I don't have it with me. Chris, I admire your patience. Honestly, it's on the list. Future me again. Right, I'm back in the workshop. Um, so the first tool I use is this one. Um, that goes in through the F hole. You undo that screw and you use that to measure the, the length that you want for the, for the sound post. So then you make your sound post. Here's an old, old one. It's kicking around. Second tool is this little thing. You can buy these online. I haven't got a link for them. Uh, basically, the, they've got like a little spring that holds the sound post. You pop that in through the F hole. Sometimes if this is a tight fit, you're gonna actually going to have to put that through the bottom eye, put this through the F hole, connect it up inside the violin. This serves the point of actually the purpose of actually pointing at where the at where the um, where the post is. So using that, you know, you guide that to wherever you want. Put the top in first, swing the bottom in. Then I leave this on and make any adjustments using the classic sound post setter. I mean, I don't use this end basically. I just use it for that end, obviously through the other F hole, push. So you know push or pull, uh, top and bottom. And when you're happy with it, then um, the way this works, basically, if you put a gentle force, and we're going to show you, against the larger plate, and then you can just pull it out. Uh, so so the, the post remains in place and this setter comes out. And um, I use the same method um, in, in reverse, basically. If a post has to come out, it's easier to put, put this in and, and actually grab it whilst it's in situ and then pull the bottom out and take it out that way. It saves a bit of faffing around. Otherwise, it's violin upside down, wiggling it around until the post ends up getting somewhere near the F hole and then bringing it in through and, and out that way. I'm sure you've, you've all been there. That's it. Back to the uh, back to the car park. It's on the list. Um, DIY dark matter. I mean, da, 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 da. out of all your tools, is there a tool that you don't have that you wish you had, or a tool that doesn't exist yet that would make your work easier? That comes to mind when you do a certain part of work you do. Yeah, and this ties in with the last question. I I have a sound post setting set up but I every time I use it I think there must be a better way of doing this so yeah maybe maybe I need to set to and design something uh yep yeah, and then uh the I don't much okay. seeing you're going to do inlay work on the fingerboard and tail please will you also inlay the ribs and top and bottom plates um the plan is to do the fingerboard and the tailpiece and the ribs. However, with this first one I'm doing, it could well be that it just ends up with inlay on the fingerboard and tailpiece, or indeed, it could be that it just ends up as a plain violin, um, because I've been working on the design for the inlay, and it is quite complicated, and I know it's gonna add quite a bit of time to it, and I want to get this first guitar-shaped violin done reasonably quickly. Um, 
in terms of how I'm going to do it, um, what my, with the ribs, I think my intention is actually to effectively do veneer marquetry uh, so that I will have one continuous sheet of very thin material as the inner part of the rib. And then on the outer, I'll have the same material um, with the design cut into it with a, with a second and perhaps even a third material. So effectively, it will be an elaborate piece of um, marquetry put onto a curved or which will then be glued together in a curved kind of section. And that, going back to our making ribs, bending ribs thing, that probably will have to be done in a mould so that I actually can do that. I'm, like I say, this is one of the reasons why I'm kind of probably holding fire on doing marquetry on this first guitar shape one is I do realise that it's quite a complex, complex undertaking. Charlotte Chapel. 4803, uh, quite how I was just writing anything, I have to come to ask what music you were using, but yeah. As a violist, I can't wait to see how this little one turns out. Yeah, it is a diddy little thing, or petite, as I called it. I mean, you know, most, you know, full-size violins have a back about, about 14 inches. This this viola has a back about, about 15. So, you know, like I say, the, the thickness of the, you know, the depth, should I say, of the body um, is one of the things I'm using to actually give it a bit more volume uh, compared with just a slightly larger violin. And there's a couple of other things that I'm doing as well. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see how it turns out as well. Monty Latham. Cool, a concert to accompany our violin making tutorial. Yeah, this was me scraping away on the uh, star above the garter. <laughs> Have you got a stack of old dresses somewhere around there? Um, no, but I'll tell you what I did. Four or five years ago, I was um, going to buy a load of plastic um, toolboxes and uh, storage boxes and things. And I went to an auction instead and I bought a whole stack. I mean, I, I think I bought five old chests of drawers and they all came in. It was like, I think the cheapest was like 25 quid and most expensive was like 70. But they, they, they came in at way under the price that you would pay for plastic storage anyway. Um, and you get these lovely old bits of furniture, which you can do what you like with. For example, cutting them up and making violins out of them, if you so choose. And then on top of that, my brother gave me a, a bureau, um, which turned out to be a particularly rich source. I mean, every single part of the thing was made out of something useful. Um, and again, you can pick those up for so little at, at auctions at the moment in, in, in the UK. And I'm sure you, you know everywhere really. It, it's just that that kind of furniture, you know, really good quality versions of that kind of furniture are valuable, but most people want nice, new, clean, stylish, if you like, things uh, in their houses. And so it's not worth repairing uh, a lot of the old, damaged, worn out ones. And so the price is quite low. Um, Pastel with Avon. I think you answered my Patreon Patreon question with this video. Uh, looks like I can use my steamer to make ribs. I think we've we've covered this really. Yeah, um, I also created moulds that hold a rib shape that will, should pretty much eliminate guessing how much they might relax before settling in place. Place in theory, at least. Thanks. Yeah, in, indeed. Yep, go for it. Sounds like um, you. I can't see any problem with what you're suggesting. Brian Timmons TX. A new subscriber and aspiring luthier here from Texas. Hi, Brian. I'm intrigued by a lot of things that you do slightly differently from the norm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like steam bending the ribs before be using a bending iron to refine the curves. That, 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 me mucking around with the, 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 the ribs seems to have um, ignited a, quite a lot of conversation, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is interesting because it is, it's so easy and you wonder why people don't do it. Um, yeah, like steam bending ribs before using a bending iron to refine the curves. With a two-step process, which is what I did this last time, um, is that a time saver or does that make the job more foolproof somehow? I would say it's a great time saver and it makes the job more foolproof. Basically, simple as that. But like I say, it, it's I don't think any one method is the right method uh, for all timbers. I think you just need to have a wide armory of approaches. 
uh, and, and that's what I do. And for that pair, that was exactly the right approach. It just worked so easily. I also am fascinated by your unusual wood choices, how you're not bound to the rigid orthodoxy of spruce and maple. Come to think of it, one of the best cellos I ever played was a modern build, which had a willow back and ribs. I rest my case. Okay, Fireman 9143. When you say it's short grained and it snapped, what exactly do you mean? Uh, when you cut them, did you get them close to quarter sawn for the grain orientation or something else? It would be awesome if you could show and discuss grain orientation and annual rings as you decide how to shape wood. I'm fairly new to woodworking and I think most people take this an uh, analysis for granted. Understood. And here I am, not in the workshop. That's not very clever, is it? Um, so, um, and I think actually, uh, I'm pretty sure someone... Oh, why have I not got that? Okay, I think someone kind of answered your question to a certain extent by using a pile of straws analogy. And that's exactly the same analogy I'm gonna use now. I think it's Gervais, actually. Basically, imagine timber as a pile of straws, basically, a stack of straws, and they are strong. If you imagine trying to pull those apart along the length of the straws, it would be really difficult. But if you want to get hold of the bundle and divide it into two, it's pretty easy, yeah? So if you've got a long piece of wood and you cut a thin piece off the end, that is the ultimate in short grain because the grain, there's your piece of wood you just cut off the end and the grain is running that way. And if you got hold of it and flexed it, it will just go snap because the grain is running that way. And the straws are running that way and there's no strength, real, very little strength that stops you just pulling those straws apart. A similar sized piece of wood with the straws running that way, it's really flexible, really strong. And that's long grain. So when you refer, refer to short grain within a piece of wood, it means there's your piece of wood and the grain isn't running ideally. It could be that it's actually, the piece of wood is cut from grain that's running that way, or it's, it's got a curve in it. In the case of flamed maple, there's a lot of short grain because the, the grain, anyone watching what I'm doing from out there is gonna wonder what the hell I'm up to, but the grain basically is doing this along the piece of wood. That's what gives it that lovely chatoyance. It's movement in the grain. So I picked, on the Spanish cedar for the ribs, I picked some pieces where they had this lovely movement and chatoyance. And I thought, oh, that's gonna be splendid. And then, snap, uh, it, because there were obviously some part of that where, you know, some of it, the grain was running okay. And then other bits where the grain was very short and it just wasn't up to the job. So hope that goes some way to explain it. Maybe next time I'm in the workshop, I'll, I'll try and do a slightly better, better version of that explanation. Uh, DIY dark matter. These must be small violas, because I think a Stradivarius violin is just under 50. Yes, yeah, I think we cover this, yeah. Basically uh, they are, well, the, the one, the first one I'm doing is um, 15. Uh, it is pretty small for viola. I mean, the normal kind of, the general kind of accepted range is like 15 and a half to 16 and a half. And there are outliers on both ends of that. And those are kind of starting to be exceptional on both ends. So this is quite a petite little instrument. And yeah, I can't wait to see how it sounds as well. Uh, yeah, so that's it, I think. So I'm gonna leave it there. Um, and I look forward to um, uploading a video fairly shortly, which is about the uh, the two American, uh, the, the wormy chestnut um, violins, which are now finished. So look after yourselves. Cheers, folks. Bye.